race to win laws and explore the stars, have created some of the most fantastic products ever designed, and we use them every day, unaware of their amazing origins. On Wicked Inventions. The Helicopter, the hovering wonder home during the war. Water purification, space technology that's claiming water for millions. Backpacks, essential kit for the military or a commuter battling to work. We reveal the amazing science and manufacture behind these wicked inventions. The helicopter has become indispensable to the military, police forces and wealthy civilians alike. With its ability to hover, take off and land vertically in a way unlike any other forms of aircraft, it can be put to use in hazardous environments, allowing for a quick escape or even life-saving rescues from dangerous situations. But where did it all begin and what role did war have to play in the helicopter's development? One of the first designs we have of a helicopter type vehicle actually comes from da Vinci in the late 15th century and he drew sketches of something that had a kind of corkscrew device on the top of it which if turned would help it to become airborne. His designs weren't too far from what would later be put into action on battlefields centuries later. It wasn't until the combustion engine was invented though that enough power could be supplied to the rotors in order to achieve flight. The first real attempt to use an internal combustion engine powered by fuel was by Jan Bahil, a Slovak event inventor, and he managed to achieve 1,500 meters of flight using a helicopter in 1907. So, how does a helicopter actually fly? A helicopter is effectively, or very simplistically at least, an airplane turned vertical. Um, in an airplane you have a propeller that turns and pulls the airplane forward, and the wings are which generate the lift. In a helicopter, you essentially have the blade, which is turning around, and that spinning blade, the propeller, is producing lift at that point, because it's directing its force directly upwards, countering the force of gravity trying to get it off, to get it back down to the ground. It was the desire to gain the upper hand in war that really saw the development of the helicopter as we know it today. Helicopters could transport people and packages and other things to, to places where you didn't need a runway, you didn't need to have a pre-built infrastructure. And that was one of the major benefits of a helicopter. So the British government got in on the act of funding it, and during World War II they were very much used, and in the Vietnam War, very heavily used by the US because there, were no, there was no such infrastructure for landing planes in the middle of, effectively, a rainforest. So the military has been heavily involved and actually uses them quite a lot for point-to-point -point transport where there is no infrastructure. Today, helicopters are still widely used in warfare and have also found their place in some commercial flights. Use in aerial photography and search and rescue missions, with their vertical climbing, landing and hovering abilities still proving unmatched by any other aircraft. Airbus helicopters are a leading aircraft manufacturer with manufacturing facilities worldwide. In their assembly plant just outside of Marseille, France, they are producing the Super Puma helicopter. The Super Puma is a four- or five-bladed, twin-engine, heavy utility helicopter. It has been used to transport presidents in Brazil and France, and was used during the war in Afghanistan. As with all Airbus helicopters aircraft, the Super Puma begins life in research and development, where engineers and designers hone the helicopter for maximum efficiency, safety and productivity. We are a company with more than 23,000 people, six and a half billion of turnover uh, and we are present in all market segments with customers around the world and with more than 30 entities around the world to serve our customers. Airbus Helicopter has today 12,000 helicopters in service, over 3,000 customers in 150 countries flying about 3 million hours a year. What Airbus Helicopters is doing today is serving civil and military customers in a 50-50 ratio and we are both producing, designing and producing new aircraft and serving our customers with support and services. And this is in a range of 60-40. Airbus have 18 assembly lines worldwide that produce their helicopters and build approximately 500 units per year. 
As you know, uh, Airbus Helicopter is a global group and uh, we have final assembly line uh, everywhere in the world. And in those uh, 18 assembly lines, we are producing roughly 500 helicopters per year. And one hundred of them being an S90 or Super Pumas. And if we focus on Super Puma, then we are delivering roughly 50 per year, 50. And the lead time for producing one helicopter is roughly 12 to 13 months. And when doing an helicopter, we start by doing the assembly of the different uh, airframe parts. We have a center fuse, we have a rear fuse, and we have a uh, front fuse. So we do the assembly of those three parts in order to, uh, to get the complete body of the helicopter. And then we will first install the electrical wires, and then we will install the hydraulic pipes, then we will install the uh, air conditioning system, and then it's like building a house. You know, we, you start uh, part per part and uh, domain per domain. Milling machines are used to form the carefully designed rotor blades for the helicopter. The blades being manufactured here are for the tail rotor. The blades have to be made from the highest quality aerospace grade metal as they are lifting enormous loads and can rotate at 265 revolutions per minute or five and a half rotations every second. These blades are smaller than the main rotor blades. Their main function is to pull against the torque of the main rotor and hold the helicopter straight. They can also be used as a rudder for steering the helicopter when in a stationary hover. Many other dynamic components of the helicopter are also produced at this assembly line. These include the main transmission gearboxes, rotor hubs and others. Transmission of power from the turbine engines to the main rotor of the helicopter takes place by the main rotor gearbox. As each engine produces over 1500 kilowatts of power on takeoff, which combined together is the equivalent of four Bugatti Veyron engines, the steel used for the components within the gearbox has to be carefully manufactured. The metal is vacuumed, melted and heat treated, giving it very efficient mechanical properties. There are many processes involved in the making of these components, such as turning and gear cutting. Once the gearbox has been completed, it can be married with the rotor hub and moved on to the assembly line. So when having, when having installed the, the, the main gearboxes and the main rotor on the helicopter, then we install the major components. The major components are there to allow the customer to do his mission. All Super Puma helicopters are twin-engine, and the two engines required are included in these main components. The cabin interior is then installed to the customer's specifications, including the seats, harnesses, instrument panels, and so on. The final step in the assembly line is the ground tests, which checks the functioning of every electrical device before it leaves for the painting and flight lines. And then the helicopter is going to, to, to the painting. And then, of course, we are doing the painting, the customer has described. I mean, we are doing what he wants. The customer satisfaction is so important for us. Uh, but of course, it is one of our most important uh, uh, duty to do it like that. So normally, the painting of an helicopter needs two to three weeks. And then we go to the flight line, in which we will do the test in flight of the helicopter with our own pilot. After a flight test, the aircraft is then presented to the customer and delivered. The Airbus Helicopters Super Puma is now ready to take to the skies. The helicopter. That's truly a wicked invention. With water covering about 70% of our planet, we may be forgiven for thinking we have plenty for our needs. But is it the right type of water? And more importantly, is it clean? And what is the connection between space exploration and water purification? It may be essential to our survival, but as dirty water is the perfect home for disease-causing microorganisms, we have always had an uneasy relationship with using this life-giving liquid. So in the olden days, they would never really use just cold, fresh water because of the contaminants in it. Even though they didn't understand the microbiology behind it, they realised that you had to boil it, so drinking tea was very much a custom, or drinking alcohol, because it had gone through a process that would eliminate and kill some of the bacteria. The invention of the microscope in the 17th century led to a greater understanding of microbiology and the presence of the tiny, unknown organisms that live in the water. And this led to the refinement of two treatments of dirty water, filtration and purification. There are two processes that you have to perform to ensure that you have clean, safe water to drink. 
Firstly, filtration, and that takes out the larger particles in the water, so it appears to be more transparent and clear. So this can include sand, but also carbon blocks are more commonly used now as well. And with the slow filtration of water through this process, the particles will be filtered out, and then you'd get the appearance of clean water below. But obviously this does not necessarily mean that you've removed all the bacteria and certainly not all the viruses that can cause these diarrheal diseases. And so a process then of making sure that you can clean the water properly and safely would be through um, purification. This process is a little bit more complicated in some ways, but in the simplest format you can actually boil the water, but we can use chemicals and UV light to help. By the 1900s, treating water with chlorine to kill harmful bacteria and organisms had been established as the main method for producing safe drinking water for large populations. And you would think clean water would now be available all over the world. But unfortunately, you would be wrong. Deaths caused by disease and polluted water are still an everyday reality to many in the developing world. With um, contaminated water, the main problem is waterborne diseases with microorganisms living in the fresh water. This can cause a huge burden to the health economy of the world. So the WHO, the World Health Organization, estimate that 1.8 million deaths occur each year due to this problem. And actually 88% of those could be prevented by providing clean water to people. NASA technology may contribute to alleviating this deadly problem. With crews living in the International Space Station continually since 2000, NASA and their partners have had to re-examine the use of water and its purification in space. Water purification is becoming more and more important in space because people now live in space for really long periods rather than just coming up from Earth with everything that they will need and coming home at the end of the mission. It's been worked out that the crew of four on the International Space Station would need more than 20 tonnes of water per year if it wasn't being recycled on, on the space station. Nowadays, even the experimental animals on the space station have um, their water byproducts recycled, uh, as well as the human beings. The solution for the International Space Station was for NASA to introduce a recycling system that processes the crew's urine and other waste water to create fresh drinking water. Operating since 2008, this system recycles up to 95% of all the water on board and features numerous filters, including one originally developed for the Space Shuttle missions, which uses iodine-impregnated resin beads to slowly release iodine into the waste fluids, killing harmful bacteria and viruses. Since the 1990s, water purification units based on NASA's iodine filter technology have been used successfully in the developing world, including portable hand pump versions which do not require power. So, recycling water in space and providing clean drinking water to some of the world's poorest populations. Water purification, truly a wicked invention. Trepid tester is in the wilderness and fancies a thirst-quenching drink. Unfortunately, his only source of water is this lake, and the water is not looking too tasty. What is he to do? Make his own DIY water filtration system, that's what. The materials he will need. An empty water bottle, some medical gauze, some sand, charcoal, one big rock, a handkerchief, a multi-tool, and of course, some dirty water, ready to be treated. To begin, take the plastic bottle and carefully cut it in two. Create a small hole in the cap of the water filter bottle. Now pack the medical gauze into the cap end. Take the charcoal and crush it into a fine powder. Take this powder and pack it tightly into the bottom of the bottle. Create another layer of gauze and then pour in a few inches of sand on top. One last layer of gauze and then place the filter on top of the bottom half of the plastic bottle and slowly pour the water into the filter. The water will slowly make its way through the layers of sand, gauze and charcoal, slowly dripping out of the bottom. The way the filter works is that each layer will trap different particles of dirt and chemicals as the water passes through them. The sand will trap larger particles of dirt while the charcoal will absorb many other impurities. When a material absorbs something, it attaches to it by chemical attraction. 
the porous nature of charcoal gives it many bonding sites. When certain chemicals pass next to the carbon surface, they attach to the surface and attract. The important thing to note is that your filter won't get rid of all the horrible stuff in your dirty water, but it will take away things like odours and many organic impurities, and even chlorine. With a few drops appearing at a time, it might be a while before our tester enjoys a drink, or especially once he's repeated the process a few times. A little while later, and the water has been filtered and is nice and clear. But hang on, don't drink it just yet. The water may be clear from dirt, but it should still be sterilised or I bring it to the boil for a few minutes before drinking. So now, we need to make a fire. So, there you are, a DIY water filtration solution. Or maybe remember to just bring a drink next time. The Backpack helps us carry all those modern life essentials. And even though it has existed for thousands of years, it was the soldiers' needs in the 20th century that saw the birth of the modern backpack. In the First World War, different backpack designs emerged, some employing a supporting frame and others not. But by the Second World War, backpacks such as the famous British Bergen had evolved to allow special forces, such as the SAS, to operate for long periods in the field, as they could now carry all their own supplies. When you get to the end of the Second World War, outdoor enthusiasts started to think of ways that they could use the backpack, the military backpack, uh, for their own uses. And in the 1950s, an American called Dick Kelty decided to try and develop a backpack that was of the military design, but that could be used as a lightweight, better option for climbing, abseiling, um, walking, and other outdoor activities. And so he started to develop this way of, again, carrying weight as best you could on your back, but also distributed to your hips, and also made of much less bulky materials than those of the military backpack. With Kelty leading the way, the backpack of today is scientifically designed to utilise modern waterproof materials and ergonomics. So each backpack is designed to have padding in most places. What this does is this relieves the points of pressure on the body in a specific area. You can spread it out over a larger area and this allows your body to cope with greater loads. When you're carrying large rucksacks like hiking backpacks, you have a a belt strap effectively that goes around your waist. What it's designed to do is to sit on top of the hips and transfer the weight through your hips rather than through your back. And so transmitting the weight through your legs allows the person to carry a greater weight over a longer distance. And then the shoulder straps essentially act as a stability measure so that the weight doesn't go off kilter. And some of the backpacks will actually have padding in certain areas and then a small vein down the center to allow airflow to the back to keep the body cool and not overheat and not overstress the body. Used for thousands of years, but refined on the battlefields of World War II, the backpack is truly a wicked invention. Chapman bags have been handmade from their traditional workshop in Carlisle, Cumbria, England, since the 1980s. The process starts with the worker cutting out panels of material for the bag from preset patterns. The panels are cut from a roll of bonded cotton which is actually three layers of material. Cotton, natural rubber, and another layer of cotton. This helps make the bag waterproof. We make bags uh, in a traditional way. Um, that's because our customers uh, like it that way. Uh, and that means we tend to use uh, very high quality materials uh, which make the bags last for a very long time. And that's got a lot to do with our heritage uh, in field sports like fishing and shooting. Obviously, when people buy those kind of bags uh, and they're going to be out in fairly rugged environments, they need to know that the bag is going to perform. So we use heavy duty waterproof canvas, uh, leather, solid brass fittings and uh, military grade cotton webbing on our bags. The leather components are then cut out by a hydraulic machine called a travelling head press. Using different shaped cutting tools, similar to that of the cookie cutter, they are able to get the exact cuts of leather required for the rucksack. These leather components are used to essentially hold the rest of the bag together. The leather is specially made for us in Kent, in England, uh, so that it's durable and will last a long time and won't mark your clothing. So all in all, it's a very authentically British product and one that should last you a very long time. 
Other components such as solid brass buckles and military grade webbing that is used for the straps are gathered together so that they can be added into production. The webbing combined with the brass straps adds extra strength, durability and reliability to the quality of the rucksack. With all the components ready, it is time for the main production of the rucksack to begin. To make a really good rucksack, you really have to ensure that the key fail-safe critical components are well made and made from durable materials. Um, if you have a rucksack, for instance, that fastens with a zip and you use a cheap zip and that zip fails, the bag can become useless. If you use a fastening um, that is weak, um, uh, it will break over time. If you use materials uh, that, for instance, are not waterproof and uh, the rucksack is designed to be used outdoors, that's going to be pretty useless. So there are a number of key fail-safe things that you have to get right with any bag uh, and with a rucksack in particular. First, a worker attaches the brass buckles to the leather straps and uses a foot press machine to implant the brass studs. The components that make the body of the bag, such as the canvas and heavy-duty straps, are carefully stitched together. The production of the rucksack involves uh, a number of different processes. So it involves cutting of materials, clicking out leather uh, in a press, and uh, assembling the various components into a package which the eventual machinist who, who stitches up the bag uh, can accept and easily use. All of the edges of the bag are left with exposed edges of raw canvas, so these are sealed carefully by bounding them in leather to keep them tidy and not exposed to the elements. For the exposed edges that are created on the inside of the bag once it has been turned up on sealing, a polycotton tape is used to close off the edge. One of our rucksacks probably takes around an hour and a half of uh, time, uh, including the stitching of the bag uh, and the preparation of the various components. Our rucksacks are exported all over the world. Uh, they're used in many different kinds of environment. And uh, one of the things that we do for clients, uh, if they particularly want it, is to modify our rucksacks uh, to accept specialist equipment and features. So uh, we make them frequently uh, for cameramen who want them specially adapted for that, and for travelers who want particular features, such as pockets in which they put um, special equipment. Once the bag has been completed, it is over to quality control, where the bag is inspected before packing. Quality control is always an important part of any production process, as it is inevitable for mistakes to be made in the production line. So here, the inspector checks for any loose stitching or loose threads that need to be cut and any imperfections with the leather. The final components, such as the string tie and labels, are also added. Packing is also an important part of the process. If it is packed incorrectly, then the rucksack will not look right when it comes out of the box. So the inspector carefully wraps the bag in paper, seals it with tape and places it in its box, making sure that it is in the right position before sealing the box and completing the process. The rucksack, truly a wicked invention. So there you have it, a dash through the hidden history, super science and amazing manufacture of products that you use every day, but have never realized their amazing background. The helicopter, water purification and backpacks, all wicked inventions.